This is a NASA engineer trying to fix a hydrogen leak just before the launch of Apollo 11. The scary thing is, he is 60 meters up and standing right next to a partially fueled Saturn V. At launch, the Saturn V contained over two and a half thousand tons of propellant. If the rocket suddenly exploded, it would have the force of an atomic bomb and everyone at the pad would be killed. But if there was an emergency that gave them time to react, like an uncontrolled fuel leak, there was a chance that they could survive. Located 12 meters below the launch pad is a place called the Rubber Room, a 1960s bunker that was designed to save astronauts and crew in the event of a disaster. We modeled the entire thing, and in this video, we're going to look at what's inside the bunker and how a group of 20 people could survive in here for several days. We'll also be giving away this awesome space shuttle framed print, so stick around to the end of the video to see how you could win. If the Saturn V had exploded on the pad, it would have created a fireball that was half a kilometer wide and over a thousand degrees in temperature. And so, in the event of an imminent disaster, workers at the pad would immediately have to make their way to the bunker. But the bunker was buried deep beneath the concrete pad, so how did they actually get there? The crew had to make their way to level A inside the mobile launch platform, the massive two-story structure that supported the Saturn V. Once it arrived at the pad, a small hatch in the platform would connect to a structure that stuck out from the launch pad. This was a 60 meter long slide that started inside the platform and went down through the concrete launch pad until it reached the bunker. At the top of the slide, a sprinkler would spray the crew with water to help them slide down the chute more easily. In just seconds, they would start to pick up an immense amount of speed as they plummeted into the depths of the launch pad. After falling down a steep drop, they would burst into a place known as the rubber room. This room was lined by thick walls of rubber in order to absorb the energy from an explosion. The rubber at the end of the slide was also designed to slow the crew down, but this didn't always work. During testing, the water would build up at the bottom of the slide, and instead of slowing them down, it caused them to slide all the way to the end at an incredible speed. One worker actually broke several bones in his body after crashing into the end. From here, the crew would make their way through this enormous blast-proof door where the actual bunker was. This room hasn't been accessible for decades, and only a handful of people have been allowed to enter. One thing that is very accessible, though, is the range of interesting documentaries on CuriosityStream, the sponsor of today's video. CuriosityStream offers a wide range of documentaries and series all about science, nature, history, technology, and more. So there's something for everyone to enjoy. And with new content dropping every week, you'll never run out of things to enjoy. CuriosityStream offers plans starting at under $5 a month, so it's a lot like getting a front row seat to the universe for the price of your morning coffee. You can watch on your TV, computer, or mobile device, anywhere and at any time. Personally, I've been watching Trajectory, which celebrates our biggest achievements in spaceflight, like the Apollo missions, the ISS, and the Hubble telescope. Not only is the content on CuriosityStream a supernova of knowledge, but their discounts are equally stellar. Sign up today at curiositystream.com slash primalspace or scan the QR code. Then use the code primalspace to get 25% off. After making their way down the slide, the crew would find themselves in the rubber room. From there, they would enter through a passageway and into the blast room, a dome-shaped room featuring 20 chairs that the crew would strap themselves into. The dome itself was made out of super thick steel and concrete capable of surviving a blast pressure of up to 500 PSI. To put this into perspective, the blast pressure from an explosion starts to become lethal for humans at around 40 PSI. In order to protect everyone inside from the immense shock waves, the entire floor was floating on a series of 24 giant springs. These disconnected the room from the surrounding concrete, meaning the vibrations had less material to travel through. The blast from an explosion could cause an acceleration of up to 75 Gs, roughly double what you'd expect to feel in a car crash. These springs would absorb most of that acceleration and reduce it to just 4 Gs, keeping the crew inside perfectly safe. But if a large explosion occurred, it would create a shockwave so immense that it would travel all the way down the slide in an instant and kill the crew inside. That's where these enormous blast-proof doors came in. Made from several inches thick steel, these doors would seal the crew inside and protect them from the shockwaves. 
These could be locked from either side by turning a wheel which caused eight giant pins to hook into the wall. Once the crew were locked inside, they would remain in their seats and wait until the danger had passed. But with up to 20 people in a sealed room, the carbon dioxide levels would quickly start to rise and breathing would become very difficult. And so to treat the air, a carbon dioxide scrubber was placed in the center of the room. This machine worked by passing the ambient air through a special filter, which would attract the CO2 molecules and separate them from the air. The clean air was then pumped back out of the machine, keeping the CO2 levels low. In order to create more oxygen, there was a supply of oxygen candles, which would burn iron powder and sodium chlorate at around 600 degrees to produce oxygen. For every one kilogram of mixture inside, each candle could produce around six hours of oxygen per person. Next to all of this was the storage area, which contained all of the food and water supplies. The food was mainly C rations and K rations, a type of canned food that was developed during the Second World War. The K rations came in three separate boxes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Each meal contained stuff like meat, cheese, cereal, fruit, biscuits, coffee, and cigarettes, giving each crew member around 3,000 calories a day. There was an industrial waste bin in the center of the room and a toilet placed behind one of the seats. Although it would be an unpleasant place to go, the crew could take care of business with a little bit of privacy. All in all, there was enough food and water to last for about four to five days. But in most circumstances, the crew would have only stayed for a few hours until the toxic fumes around the launch pad had dissipated. But how would they actually escape? When it was time to leave, the crew had two main escape routes. After leaving the bunker through the other blast door, they would enter into a narrow tunnel. This was 360 meters long and would take them all the way to an air intake building on the edge of the launch site. This building was essentially a giant fan that would suck in clean air and direct it into the rooms below the launch pad. After walking for around 10 minutes through a very cramped and dark space, the crew could finally escape to freedom. But if the tunnel was somehow blocked from the explosion, the crew would have to go back and choose the alternative escape route. Right next to the tunnel was a door that led directly into the environmental control rooms, a labyrinth of rooms and corridors beneath the pad that would eventually lead to the outside world. But with such a large explosion, the damage to the pad would be catastrophic, and NASA were concerned that the crew would become completely trapped inside the bunker. And so, to add to the list of safety precautions, they placed an emergency escape hatch at the top of the blast room. This didn't actually lead anywhere, but in the event of the escape routes being blocked, NASA would dig through the concrete and sand within the launch pad to reach the hatch and free the crew. Thankfully, none of this ever needed to be done. The bunker was never used, and after the Apollo missions ended, it was abandoned, leaving an incredible piece of NASA history frozen in time. Over the years, the bunker fell into disrepair, and various animals made their way into the bunker. Now, only a select group of people have access to this old relic, which will most likely remain untouched for many more decades. And now, time for something really special. The winner of last month's giveaway is Tony Viglas. Congratulations! In the next video, we'll be giving away this awesome space shuttle framed print. All you have to do is sign up at the link below and leave a comment saying what you think NASA should do with the bunker now. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.